Living True Life Church, thank you for joining us online today. We pray that you're blessed and encouraged and challenged deeply as you listen to this message. Stay tuned for some worship. burdens down My yoke is easy now What a friend I found in you Sing a lay I lay my burdens down my yoke is easy now What a friend I found in you yeah. Cause you're the world I won't run dry Only you can satisfy Through every sea my life Cause you are the well that won't run dry Sing I'll thirst no more I will thirst no more Refresh my soul, living waters flow from you. Oh, you're the well, cause you're the well that won't run dry. And only you can satisfy through every season of my you are the well that won't run dry. Oh, you're the well that won't run dry. Only you can satisfy through every season of my life. Cause you are the well that Given me freedom, you have given me joy, you have taken my burdens. Oh, we declare, you have given me freedom, you have given me joy, you have taken my burdens. Oh, you have given me freedom, you have given me joy, you have. Taking my burdens Oh, you have given me freedom You have given me joy You have taken my burdens Cause you're the well that won't run dry Only you can satisfy my soul With every season of my life you are the well that won't run dry. Oh, you're the well that won't run dry. And only you can satisfy through every season of my life. Cause you are the well that won't run dry. You are the well. Now is ended. 
in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. It's on the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise. It's Jesus, your light. Oh, you reign above it all. You reign above. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth interrupt his song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Oh, so you sent, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory. Throned on the highest praise, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, and throned on the highest praise, and you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, and throned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. But you reign above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Above it all, let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Yes, you reign above. to boost its interest rates up to 18% as it battles against financial collapse. The move is designed to stabilize the And their economic messages to win the support of undecided voters.
Greetings in the name of the Lord. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be continuing our series, The Great Issues of Faith from Elijah's Life. And today we're going to be talking about oppression. Reach for your Bibles and let's turn to the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Nothing distorts reality and Christian joy more than depression. Depression can paralyze a Christian with fear, isolation, criticism, tiredness, and fruitlessness. When it strikes, it seems like reason disappears. In its place comes a distorted perception. I looked up the word perception, and it just simply means the act of perceiving or apprehending by means of the senses or the mind, understanding, discernment. As an illustration, a hunter had a, a very unusual dog, and he decided he wanted to show it off one day to one of his kind of a not so upbeat friends. He was kind of always a discourager. And as they waited, a flock of ducks finally flew overhead, and the man shot one. It fell into the water. The man told his friend, now I want you to watch this remarkable dog of mine fetch that duck. He snapped his finger, and immediately, immediately that dog took off running on top of the water, all the way out to the duck, and all the way back. Certain that his negative friend would be amazed, he asked him, what do you think of my dog now? His negative friend replied, can't swim, huh? <laughs> Perception. Satan's most effective tool against the Christian is not outright sin, it's discouragement, which leads to many sins, or at best it incapacitates a believer to be unproductive, resentful toward others, and angry at God. The Bible teaches that even the best of Christians can become depressed, and that depression's damage can be a powerful one on those who experience it, as well as those who come in contact with those that are depressed. Compassion and companionship are the way out of oppression and depression. Let's look at some of the dynamics of depression in 1 Kings 19. First of all, there's fear. Through the death of the prophets of Baal, uh, which was a result of God's dealing with the nation Israel. It's the prophet of God that gets the blame. Elijah's strong point is one of courage, but it becomes his weakness, which is fear. Ahab, King Ahab, tells Jezebel, his wife, everything Elijah had done regarding the contest in Mount Carmel. Elijah was still riding high from the great victory brought by God's miraculous power. Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah to tell him that he was the target of her death squad. And within 24 hours, he was going to die. It seems strange that Jezebel would even warn him. Perhaps her intent all along was just to scare him enough to get him out of town. Really making a martyr out of him might backfire. But getting rid of him would discredit him and at least minimize additional influence on the people. Perhaps she knew that even the strongest men of God can become discouraged and fearful. Elijah was discovering once again the downside to successful ministry. Suddenly, the man Elijah, who was high on victory, experienced fear. And so instead of enjoying the fruits of his successful ministry, he finds himself consumed with his own sense of well-being. He runs for his life out of Jezreel to Bathsheba in the southern kingdom, a distance of about 100 miles. Now, although Elijah had encouraged Ahab to eat before going to Jezreel, Elijah hadn't. And he had run under the power of God ahead of Ahab and had still not eaten before this bad news hit. Now he runs under a different power than that of the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of fear. He runs a hundred miles. But this run would not leave him refreshed like the energy of the Holy Spirit came to him on the first run. Leaving his servant in Beersheba, Elijah goes alone to the desert, another full day journey. And this guy has done some serious traveling. All this fear had created in Elijah's mind the idea that his ministry was basically over and it was fruitless. Israel had repented. Revival was in the air. But now it wouldn't continue, all because one leader in Israel was out to get him. 
The fear not only cut short his ministry in Israel, but it also stole from him the joy of his ministry on Mount Carmel, which happened only a few days earlier. What he was feeling was, what difference does it make? He finds a broom tree and he lays down. I, I looked up what a broom tree was. The broom tree is a desert shrub that grows across Arabia and throughout the Judean wilderness. Its deep roots draw in the moisture of land that is not otherwise a scene that seems to be barren. In the Bible, the broom tree often appears in moments of despair as well as times of divine encounter. Ironically, he now prays as he sits under the broom tree that God would take his life we know that God never does answer his prayer to die, but instead he and another man in the Bible, Enoch, are instead translated directly into heaven. Really, if this was how he really felt he wanted to die, listen, he didn't have to run away. Just Jezebel was more than happy to oblige his request. This wasn't what Elijah really wanted. It was simply his way of saying, my life has been fruitless. This is supported by the additional statement, I am no better than my ancestors, meaning they didn't succeed in bringing Israel back to God, neither have I. Here's the idea. My ministry is just as much a flop as all the other failures before me. What factors have led to this extreme fatigue and depression? Well, first of all, there was a long-term activity without proper nutrition. Mistreat the body, and it does affect the soul. Remember, Elijah hasn't eaten since the uh, confrontation on Mount Carmel several days from this point in time and has traveled almost 370 miles. Number two, since this covers several days, he must have also missed some sleep. And then three, loneliness. Loneliness contributes to the weariness. While mostly alone in Israel, he does have a servant. He chooses to leave that servant in Beersheba while he travels alone in the desert. And number four, he had acted without God's direction on the trip. This is one of the few times he does this in his life. Five, he didn't pray about the conflict. He just panicked and he ran. And then number six, he sought no counsel or advice from any friends or supporters. Seven, he assumed the worst about himself and about God and God's family. And then number eight, he forgot all about God's other expressions of help and goodness he only saw the moment. And then nine, he made no plans for being in the desert. He took no provisions for survival. So here, here we see Elijah the prophet. He's rebellious. He's angry. He's hurt. He's confused. He's resentful. He's unthankful. He's uncaring. And they all rear their ugly traits in quick succession as the process of despair unfolds itself. As an illustration, during World War II, the enemy conducted experiments to find the most effective way to get information from prisoners of war. The most effective means of punishment that almost always worked to retrieve or to get that information from even the most patriotic and the strongest soldier was solitary confinement. After some time in solitary confinement, most men would tell all because alone, all the values held dear are abandoned because there seems to be no hope. But God, in his great compassion, comes to Elijah in spite of the fact that Elijah wasn't where he was supposed to be or doing what he was supposed to be doing. God cares about him as a person and his needs. The issues could wait. What Elijah needed most right now was some practical and loving attention. Benjamin West, the great painter, describes how he came to love painting. As a young boy, he decided one day to paint a picture of his sister while his mother was away. He got out the bottles of ink and started to paint, but soon, instead of a wonderful masterpiece, he had created a mess all over the room. His mother came back home and, of course, saw the mess, and, but instead of scolding him, she picked up the, quote, portrait from the floor and said, what a beautiful picture of your sister. And she leaned over and kissed him. Later in life, he said, with that kiss, I became a painter. <laughs> See, Elijah had made a mess, had made a mess, but God was going to kiss him. 
Elijah fell asleep. God made some bread and put on some coffee, we see in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah eats and he drinks. It wasn't coffee, it was bread and water. But he lays down again, he was weary. A second time, God gets him up and feeds him again. Now, this soul food gave him the strength for a long journey toward God. God strengthened him for the 40 days and 40 night trip to Mount Sinai, the same mountain Moses met God on. This trip was intended to be a break from ministry to recharge the prophet. Now, was Elijah cured? Nope, not at all. He still hasn't focused properly on reality. Though his physical needs have now been met, he's now rested, he's fed, he's in God's presence again, but he's still not seeing things right. His perspective is still off. God lovingly asks him this question, what are you doing here, Elijah? Unfortunately, the answer Elijah gives indicates just how distorted he saw everything. He said, I've been zealous for the Lord. That's true so far. But Israel has rejected your covenant. Now, that's not totally true. It just seemed this way at the moment. He continues, all the others are dead. I'm totally alone. That's not true. He had been told earlier by Obadiah that at least 100 prophets of God still lived. Elijah assumed he would die too, even though he had witnessed God's answering his prayer in front of all of Israel. In Romans 11.3, Paul states that this response was almost a prayer against Israel from Elijah. Elijah is simply bitter and puts himself above his brethren in terms of their devotion to God. God is not put off by his bitter servant. Instead, God decides to try another way to refocus Elijah, something a, a little more dramatic. Elijah's anger centered around the seeming unfruitfulness of ministry after the events with Israel and the great fire from heaven, you know, when it burned up the sacrifice and licked up the water and, and consumed the stones and all of that. Perhaps Elijah was wondering why God didn't zap Jezebel with fire that way too. Why didn't God use the power that he had to take her out? So what does God do? He sends a powerful wind that shakes the mountains, tears the rocks from the mountains. But the Lord was not found in the wind. God next sends an earthquake, but the Lord was not found in the earthquake. God then sends fire. This sounds familiar, but God was not in the, found in the fire. After the fire, there's only a gentle whisper. God was in the whisper. What's the point? Simple. The dramatic flare like fire might get the people's attention, but it's the simple spoken word of God that will bring real change and revival in a man or a woman. Unfortunately, Elijah had run away and he was still angry at God, blaming God for not doing the next part of the revival. But this was the part Elijah himself was to be responsible for. A man recently was reported to be suing a hospital. A doctor had performed staple surgery on his stomach to help him lose weight. A couple of days after surgery, he raided the hospital refrigerator <laughs> and stuffed himself with everything he could find. This tore open the staples and forced another surgery. He was suing the hospital for having a refrigerator near his room. He claimed the temptation was too great. Thus, the complications were not his own fault, but the hospital's. Elijah had done the same thing. He was blaming God for the failure of the revival to continue in Israel and his having to run for safety, thus not being able to preach. God now gently asks again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Did Elijah get the point? Nope. Elijah simply repeats verbatim the same response to God, indicating a stubborn refusal to hear what God was trying to say to him. Boy, how often this happens to Christians who are depressed. They, they could hear a sermon, a message on it, and still miss the message. It was going to take some specific steps to restore Elijah, one item at a time. 
The first step was to get him to return the way he had came, one stop at a time. Running away didn't solve his problem. It won't solve your depression problem either. Now, it might temporarily relieve some of it, but even if you go somewhere else, if the issues that caused the depression aren't dealt with, they'll return with new faces. The trip home was given with a promise of useful ministry ahead. In other words, purpose, purpose. Restoring this promise of fruitfulness in ministry helps bring Elijah some first stages of healing. More than 30 years ago, an old man in East Tennessee was found to have an unusual morning ritual. He filled his sack with acorns. And taking a wooden stick, he would walk through a burned out forest area in the mountains. And here and there, he stopped and he would poke a hole with that stick. And then he would drop in an acorn. Then he would cover it with dirt. When asked why he did this as an old man, he replied, someone has to think of the future. Today, there's a great forest where this man once walked. The promise of a fruitful, fruitful future drove him on. Now, God also reminds Elijah, too, that he's not only the only servant of God, he's not the only zealous servant of his, that he's part of a larger family of believers, some who are just as good and perhaps just as bad as he is. Now, this settles this issue of aloneness. In a sense, these 7,000 others were a notch above Elijah at this point. They hadn't fled for personal safety like him. His brothers are, are not what he supposed hypocrites and weaklings, as he assumed. It was time to return to the family of God. Slowly, God was refocusing his perspective of everything. Now, we go to the latter portion of this chapter, and this final stage was critical to full recovery. Nowhere does it indicate that he went back to Beersheba and recovered his former servant. God was instead assigning him a new friend, someone whose faith was upbeat. And sometimes we have to do this in our own lives. This new friend was strong, and he had a commitment like Elijah. He really was sent by the Heavenly Father because he knew that he needed an earthly friend. The choice of companionship can make the difference in the future. Elijah finds a man named Elisha. He found him plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Elisha was rich. He was from a wealthy family, yet he was plowing himself, a very hardworking man. God always calls those who are presently working. Remember, Peter was fishing when he received his call. Elijah, the prophet, goes up to him, and he throws his mantle around Elisha. This was a sign adopting Elisha as his successor in ministry. Elisha requests just a moment to return to kiss his father and his mother goodbye. Now, this was not meant as a delay tactic like in Luke chapter 9, 61, where the man wanted to wait until he buried his father, meaning when they finally passed away and were gone. This was possibly a, a great delay. But instead, this was a sign of respect and obedience to the Ten Commandments to honor his father and his mother, to show thankfulness for their ministry to him as a son all those years. Elijah had found the right kind of friend, someone who was positive, obedient, loving to his family, a good choice of a friend. Elisha demonstrated how much worldly goods affected him. He he, he burns his plow and slaughters his oxen. There's no turning back, no holding on to the riches. This guy was a great choice for friendship. Elijah was back in the saddle of ministry, this time with some depression-proof help. As a conclusion, even the most faithful servants of God can have times of failure and depression. At such times, God is faithful to love us and nurture us back to spiritual health. Elijah's recovery included promises of fruitful ministry. He's not alone, and a close friend who is upbeat and full of faith and an encourager comes alongside to help him. If you're depressed, find the right friends. If you know someone that is depressed, be that right friend. 
Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this message today. Thank you, Lord, that you've included it in the Word of God. Father, there are those today that are going through struggles. This is a, this is a different time than we've ever lived through. And some may be battling depression. But Lord, we know that you are a God that loves us and you're concerned about us. Sometimes we shut other people out, thinking we just want to deal with this all alone. But we need other people in our lives. Help us be careful who we allow enter into our lives. But God, help us to be open to those that you've brought alongside of us to help us through the difficulties we're going through. I pray, Lord, if we know someone, if we're aware of someone that is in distress, that we would become that friend. We would become that prayer warrior. We would become that individual to help them out of their, their pit. Lord, I pray today that you will speak into our lives by this message, by the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Take me back to the garden Lead me back to the moment I heard your voice Take me back to communion Lead me back to the moment I saw your face And it was so, so simple It was easy to love And no space between us It was easy to trust Cause you are closer Closer than my skin You are in the air I'm breathing in And here's where the dead things come back to living I feel my heart beating again It feels so good to know This is the garden Here in the place I'll find you close And this is communion Here in the place I'm fully known And it is oh so simple You're so easy to love there is no space between us You're so easy to trust Cause you are closer, closer than my skin You are in the air I'm breathing in Cause here's where the day Back to living, I feel my heart beating again. It feels so good to know you are my friend. This is where I'm meant to be. Me and I don't have to prove a thing Cause you've already approved a man And this is where we're meant to be Yes it is Me and you and you and me And I don't have to prove a thing Cause you've already approved a man We declare This is where we're meant to be Thing, Cause you've 
have already approved of me. Cause you are closer, closer than my skin. You are in the air I'm breathing in. This is where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. Here's where the dead things come back to living. I feel my heart beating again. I feel so good to know you as a friend oh it feels so good to know you are my friend oh. thank you for listening to that message we know how difficult it may be to process some of the heavy topics and issues we're talking about here in this series. The Holy Spirit has spoken specific things to your heart. It's possible that you have questions that you would like further discussion on. If so, we really encourage you to reach out to one of our pastors or leaders who are available and would love to have an open dialogue with you. Just simply go to our website at www.tlfchurch.com connect or you can send us a text at 323-389-7006. Good morning. We just wanted to share a few quick announcements with you, being that the holidays are quickly coming upon us. Uh, 2020, as all of you know, I'm not revealing any secrets, has been unprecedented in so many ways and has impacted families that it has never impacted in such a way before. So this year around the holidays, we, as True Life Fellowship and True Life Fellowship Pantry. As our outreach, we always make sure that we have food boxes available and toys for the children in our community. This year, because of circumstances beyond our control, we are not going to receive toys from the normal source we receive them from. So we have decided, and I'm working alongside of some other colleagues and friends to do our own toy drive this year. So we're going to target children between one and 18 and all of those kids at heart. But what we would like to do is follow the model of something to eat, something to wear, something to read and a want. And if you have any questions about what those are, you can see me. I think that they're explanatory, but something to read, a color book, maybe for a younger age, a comic book, an actual printed book, um, something to eat, some candy or sweets that might embody the holiday season that a kid might enjoy, um, something to wear, gloves, scarves, so on and so forth, remembering kids of all ages, and then something to want, maybe a piece of sporting, sporting equipment, a ball, um, a bat, a racket. And again, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to see me. Um, also with our food boxes, as I mentioned, we are planning to provide food for Thanksgiving and Christmas, since so many families are going to go without otherwise. So we are going to put together some lists of food. And again, that'll be available on the website shortly and also raise funds for that because some of the food we'll be able to buy locally through a family that owns a grocery store and that way we're helping them their employees we're putting money back into our local economy and we're going to be able to feed our community so that is our goal there and again if you have any questions you can see myself or any staff for those questions so the third and the most important uh, announcement we have this year is there is a family that is very near and dear to this heart that has deep roots for many years in this church. It is the York family whose parents attend here, the Hewells. And this family has been teaching abroad. Uh, both uh, the mom and the dad have been teaching abroad 
for a little over a year. And again, because of unprecedented times, they're experiencing even deeper issues than we are in regards to supply and demand. So we would like to, for them and their three children and the one on the way, we would like to be able to support that family as our Christmas sponsorship this year, as we do every year. We have chosen as a staff to support that family. And of course, because they're overseas, it's gonna look a little bit different than our normal angel tree would look. It's going to look through financial contributions. Because of shipping and export regulations, uh, that is gonna be the best way we can help that little family so far away that cannot see their physical family this year to be able to have some joy in their lives. So we ask that you please put that on your list of things that you need to do for this holiday season. If you should have any additional questions regarding these amazing opportunities and outreaches to sponsor our community and the families we love, please feel free to go to our website at www.tlfchurch.com. And there is a link there that you can follow to contact myself, Lisa, or other staff with any questions or concerns you might have. Thank you and God bless. Remember, you can give online through our website or you can send in your tithes and offerings by mail. You can find all the info on how to do that by going to www.tlfchurch.com slash online dash giving. Thank you so much for your continual support during this time. We want to let you know that we have our Kids Church Online that meets on a weekly basis through our secured Google Classroom. If you're interested in our Kids Church Online platform, please visit our TLF Online page. Click on the Kids Church Sign Up button to connect with one of our leaders. On Sunday nights, our prayer team is committing one hour of prayer from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you have any prayer requests or praise report, you can leave us a message on our TLF online page, or you can send us an email at prayer at tlfchurch.com or send us a text at 323-389-7006. On Wednesday nights, we have our midweek unplugged Bible study at 7 p.m. in which a new devotional will be posted on our website. Join us for this amazing study on the Book of Luke. We thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you are blessed, encouraged, and challenged through that message. Hit like, subscribe, feel free to share this video with others. We love you. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. God bless.